Hello, and welcome to the Medical Center Hour, the University of Virginia's weekly public forum on medicine, healthcare, and society. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Health Humanities and Ethics in the School of Medicine. We're grateful that you've joined us for today, and please come back every Wednesday. The slides that uh, precede and follow this program provide some resources, uh, some information about continuing education credit for health professionals. They also provide a link to our center's website for information about today's presenter and a link to Medical Center Hour's YouTube channel where you'll find uh, program recordings. Today's program is being closed captioned and recorded and will be posted to YouTube. On Zoom, we handle uh, audience contributions using the Q&A function. Please write your questions and comments there and we'll be monitoring them as they come in. We'll then make them the stuff of my conversation with our presenter at the close of the hour. Our program today is the 2021 BICE Memorial Lecture of the UVA School of Nursing. The BICE Lecture at Medical Center Hour is the heart of a long-standing partnership Medical Center Hour has had with the School of Nursing, a most valuable interprofessional collaboration. This BICE Lecture, Anchored in Nursing, A Life in Leadership, is presented by Rebecca Rimel, who looks back on a most successful career with the Pew Charitable Trusts, one of this country's and the world's most innovative and highly influential public charities. For the last 26 of her 37 years with Pew, Rebecca Rimel served as president and chief executive officer, from which position she led and oversaw a significant expansion of the trust's engagements and activities. As we'll discover, she understands her service at Pew as anchored in nursing, in what she learned and practiced actually as a nurse at UVA. Management under pressure, clear communication, purpose and motivation, empathy and caring. I'll turn now to School of Nursing Dean, Pam Cipriano, who will introduce Rebecca Rimel. Welcome Pam and welcome Rebecca. Thank you, Marcia. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today who will deliver the Zulu May Faber Vice Lecture. This lecture is named for the beloved former UVA nursing dean who passed away in 1975 from breast cancer. Her husband, Professor Raymond Weiss, also beloved by students who taught across grounds and was revered here for years, uh, served in various leadership roles. He endowed this lectureship in her honor. We're pleased to be able to join Medical Center Hour to bring an inspiring thought leader to speak about issues that really matter for the future of nursing and medicine. Today's issue, leadership, is timeless yet personal, as you'll hear from Re Rebecca Rimel and her journey in a life of leadership. Most of us acquire skills and experience we need to succeed across the span of our careers, with each new role boosting our confidence and increasing our competencies. But few of us have had a first job that proves to be as foundational and consequential as the one our speaker today experienced. After earning her BSN from UVA in 1973, Rebecca Rimel was hired as head nurse of UVA's hospital's emergency room. She often worked night shift from 11 to 7 a.m. in a job that was intense, challenging, and grounding. It was that first job, she told us early last year, perhaps more than any other, that prepared her for her life course and readied her for anything she might face in her professional career. Rebecca will tell you the school, university, and Charlottesville, where she grew up, were quite different in the 70s and 80s. Times were different for women then too, but strong, intellectually curious, and compassionate nurses like Rebecca, known as Becky to her classmates, repeatedly and deftly made their mark rising above any limitations social and political systems tried to place on them. With courage and drive, these individuals stretched the boundaries of what it meant to be a nurse, in the process asserting that nurses make excellent caregivers, yes, but also great managers, scientists, scholars, business people, and of course, leaders, as in Rebecca's case, also CEOs and presidents. 
Rebecca was part of UVA's first emergency nurse practitioner program and lobbied passionately for UVA's purchase of its first air ambulance, the vehicle we today call Pegasus. She was appointed as an assistant professor in UVA's Department of Neurosurgery, the first nurse ever to assume a faculty role in the School of Medicine. She conducted research on the impact that head injuries have on attention by studying football players. And her publication of that study was chosen as the lead paper in the 50th anniversary meeting of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. It wasn't long after earning her MBA that Rebecca was tapped by the Pew Charitable Trust, one of the world's most respected grant making and philanthropic organizations to lead its scholars program in the biomedical sciences, a group that has to date produced four Nobel laureates. In 1988, five years after joining Pew, she became its executive director, then in 1994, its president and CEO. She served in that role for nearly three decades, retiring from the organization in 2020. It is her name, in her name, that Pew endowed the new Dean's Chair, a professorship that the School of Nursing's seventh Dean, my successor, will hold. A Kellogg National Fellow, she is an often feted alumna, having earned the school's Distinguished Alumna Award in 1988 and the UVA Women's Center Award in 1999. She is also a Fellow of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia and a member of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, along with its prestigious Wistar Association. It is with great pleasure that I introduce today's speaker and our 2021 Vice Lecturer, Rebecca Rimel, whose expansive and accomplished professional life has indeed been anchored in nursing. And thank you for that uh, amazingly generous introduction. Um, that's very, very kind of you. I think only my mother would have uh, done one, uh, done me so proud. Um, I, it is an honor to be giving the vice lecture, someone who gave so much to the University of Virginia and also so much uh, to nursing. Uh, I, I want to start uh, my comments where I plan to end them, and that is to thank uh, nurses and healthcare providers sincerely for what they have done uh, during this COVID pandemic. It has been extraordinary to watch their selfless uh, giving to patients, uh, sharing and putting themselves in harm's way every day. I have always been very proud to be uh, a nurse, but never more so than over the last year. So uh, for that, uh, my sincerest gratitude, and I know you have the gratitude of a grateful nation uh, and a grateful world. It was many years ago that the Wall Street Journal actually did an article about our work at Pew. And um, in that he said, and can you believe it? She was a nurse. And so I called the reporter and I thanked him for the article, which was balanced. And um, at the end, I said, you know, you only made one error. And you don't really like, um, reporters don't like to hear that they made mistakes. And he said, what is that? And he said, I am a nurse. I think that was lost on him, but it won't be to my many nursing colleagues in the audience. Uh, once a nurse, always a nurse. We carry that with us throughout our life course. Um, I, you know, there are some benefits, believe it or not, to getting older, uh, in addition to being in the COVID uh, line, uh, vaccine line first. Um, and some of those benefits are that you have a bit more perspective on life's journey. And so um, some of those perspectives can be informative, some of them amusing, and I'm hoping today that I can share just a few of those uh, with you. Much has been written about leadership thousands, no doubt millions of books, how to teach it, how to recognize it, how to mentor it. Um, is it some gift that we're given at birth? Is it something that we are taught? Um, and I really don't have any great insights on that. I think we all have our perspectives, but what I do know is mentoring in the moment matters a lot. And probably if you ask everyone in this audience, who their first and maybe even most important mentors were, they would say uh, their parents. And that certainly was true for me. But I wanna share my first professional mentoring moment with you. And it was on the grounds at UVA. Uh, and it was at the height of the Vietnam War. Uh, Kent State had just occurred and we had witnessed um, uh, fellow students, colleagues killed when they were protesting the Vietnam War. 
There were state troopers um, at University Hall waiting to discipline us. The Board of Visitors had said that if we continued to demonstrate, we would be expelled. We would not be able to take our uh, final exams and there would be serious consequences. It was Edgar Shannon that day that stood on the steps of the rotunda and actually told us that he understood our anger. He understood our need to lift our voice. He understood our need to care and that he would do everything personally possible to make sure that we were able to continue to take our exams at a later date and were not penalized. He did this at great personal sacrifice. The Board of Visitors was not happy. And I came to understand that this really was a leadership. It wasn't taught in a book, but it was witnessing somebody taking a stand at great personal sacrifice. I was fortunate through the years to see other people do similar um, acts of leadership and they were always inspirational and served as a guidepost um, for me. Like many of you, I'm often asked to um, counsel young people about their life course and journey and how to have an effective career, how to get up the ladder, how to perhaps become a leader. And I think, uh, sadly, we might do a disservice to young people by uh, saying to them that that life course is linear. If they climb one rung on the ladder, the next will follow and the next will follow. Well, you know, that's not true today and it never was true. We all know that hard work matters and preparation, commitment, but we also know that success comes with a bit of the dose of luck and the sort of hopeful um, effect of knowing when to seize that luck. And that was certainly true uh, for me. I only once in my life had a job where I actually would watch the clock and wonder if it was broken about once an hour because it didn't seem to move. And I made a commitment to myself that whatever I did, it was going to be fulfilling, and most importantly, it was going to add joy. And unfortunately, and fortunately for me, that has been my life course. I'm often asked, how does one go from nursing to a career at um, a, a large public charity? Well, again, with a little bit of luck and some preparation, but it was all because of nursing. I was engaged um, in head injury research at the University of Virginia on minor head injury. And my research had been written up in that article in the Wall Street Journal I described. And because of, uh, again, some luck, I was asked to go to Philadelphia. I've never been north of Washington, I gotta be honest. And I was assigned to follow around um, a very um, important person, take notes so that he could look quite smart at the end of this conference. And about halfway through the conference, this gentleman came over introduced himself and he said, aren't you the woman that was discussed in this article in the Wall Street Journal last week? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, my wife and daughter have had a minor head injury and everybody thinks that their symptoms are not real, that they're malingering. And he said, but it's exactly as you described. He said, could we have lunch? So I said to my girlfriend, fellow nurse, I said, so who is this guy? And she said, well, that's the president of Yale, Bart Giamani who some of you know me, went on to be the baseball commissioner. Well, off to lunch we went um, and with him, he had uh, a Yale alum. Turns out that was the Pew family accountant. The last of the four donors to Pew passed away, uh, Ms. Seppel, who cared a lot about healthcare. It's four years later, they decide to hire their first, pers their first staff person and decide a physician might be rather expensive maybe a nurse would do. And they said, this person helped me uh, very much uh, with Bart Giamani and his uh, wife and daughter. So that's how I ended up. I often, people say, how did you prepare for this role? The answer is I was doing something I loved, my research at UVA, uh, and uh, this opportunity just happened uh, along. About four weeks into the job, I realized that it was not what I had thought. And so I did what anybody would do. I call my mom and I says, I've made a tragic professional mistake. And she said, and I knew exactly what this meant, apply yourself and above all else, do not embarrass your, this family, which meant you're not coming home. So sometimes those mentoring moments can be tough. Uh, sometimes they can be supportive, but the lessons I learned in nursing um, have been invaluable to me. 
first of all, in nursing, we know everything takes a team, whether it's in the surgical suite or the C-suite, that is exactly the same lesson we need to learn. We need to surround ourselves with the absolute very best talent. We need to know our limits. We're not good at everything. We need to have people who are smarter and more gifted at certain things to, to help us achieve our goals. And we need to encourage unpopular and dissenting voices, particularly if we're in a leadership position because it will help us make better uh, decisions. And we need to keep an open mind and a willingness um, to follow others' advice. We shouldn't ask for it unless we're willing to hear it. There's often many jokes made about uh, lawyers, but I would say some of the very best advice I got along the way uh, was, from, was from lawyers, my general counsel and others. We were attempting to um, straighten out a very difficult situation with the Barnes Foundation. So I mean, some of you may have visited it. It's a fabulous collection of art in Philadelphia. It was engaged in endless litigation and we had finally decided we'd come to the end of the road. There was no way to solve it. And sitting in a boardroom, I was admitting defeat. And a then lawyer, a very wise man on our board said, you know, you could go um, to the state Supreme Court in Pennsylvania. It is the only court in the country that has something called a King's Bench Petition. I said, a what? He said, well, and all of you have lawyers as friends, ask them if they know what a King's Bench Petition is, and I guarantee you, most of them won't. It allows the Supreme Court to reach down into the, 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 the lowest court, take any case and decide it overnight. We filed the petition, the Supreme Court decided it, and the rest is history. And that's how the Barnes Collection was saved and how it's now available for anyone who would like to see it. So I learned my lesson over and over, wise people with good advice should be listened to. Uh, nurses understand this because we're really trained that our observation techniques and our lifelong learning needs to be honed. You know, uh, innovation um, is uh, not well understood because we all know it when we see it, but we really have a hard time describing it. But I really think an open mind and an eagerness to learn are key uh, to innovation. It's certainly something that we are gifted uh, in nursing and taught early on. But I used to tell my staff, in, you ought to have a hundred new ideas all the time. But there are only two or three of those ideas that are really ripe for acting on. They may not be feasible, they may not be wise, and you need to surround yourself with people that can help you determine what those three ideas are uh, that could be successful. I'm gonna share just a couple and all the, re all the success of these go to my colleagues at Pew, but I remember it was 1989 and our new head of the environment program came in my office and he said, we have to work on a really, really big issue. And I said, what's that? And he said, climate change. Now think about 89, had you even heard what it was? I hadn't. I said, what is it? And he said, well, think of it this way. There'll be palm trees growing in Philadelphia. I said, well, that doesn't sound so bad. Once we got over the humor, I understood just how serious a problem it was. And I think long and hard about what would have happened if we as a country and we uh, as citizens of the globe had started to work in earnest on climate change in 1989. But we had other big ideas that were more successful. The same individual came to me and said, we need to do for the oceans what was done for the tropical forest. Um, and this was in the mid nineties. And he said, I think we ought to create the first generation of parks in the sea. I said, parks in the sea? He said, yes, think about it. A place you can go and enjoy it, but you can't take anything out but a photograph. And he said, we could create 22 of them. They'd be the size of Texas or larger. Well, what a big idea that it turned out was implementable. And it was George H.W. Bush that created the very first of these in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Today, I think the number is at 18, marching its way uh, to 22. But data does need to drive decisions. We understand the critical need for this in healthcare. We're, we're very data-driven. Um, data 
And another, in any leadership position, I think this is important. Another example, the same individual came and said, you know, I think we can set aside 100 million acres in the boreal forest in Canada that they'll be protected forever. And the reason I believe this, and he gave the list and the data and the facts. Well, he turned out he was right. And then over the next decade, with the help of First Nations groups and the government of Canada and many, many others, we were able to achieve a billion acres, one billion acres set aside to be protected in perpetuity. So sometimes big ideas can start small, but they always need to start uh, with data. But sometimes in leadership, the hardest I think is deciding what not to do. Uh, again, another example from my time at Pew, we worked very, very hard um, in, uh, some years ago to get legislation passed on campaign finance reform. It was a huge win. McCain-Feingold, it was challenged in the Supreme Court. We, we worked and fought all the way, won that litigation, a huge success. They would have limited uh, the amount of money uh, going in um, to campaigns from the individual sources or from companies or other organizations. And only to have it overturned three years later. So success was fleeting, it was sweet, but then I was asked repeatedly year after year, why don't you get back in, why don't you try again? And the answer was clear because the facts were not in our favor and we did not feel that it was winnable. So sometimes data can be your friend, but sometimes and often it can tell you what not uh, to do. In everyone's career, we understand the importance of accountability, performance, and evaluating uh, results. And again, uh, from my experiences at Pew and leadership, that was true in our work on antibiotic resistance, which we started many, probably 15 years ago. We got into the area because of the impact on animal agriculture, only to begin to understand its huge implications for healthcare. And now I do get a chuckle when I walk by a subway or whatever, and they tout that everything they have is antibiotic uh, free. Well, we still don't have enough antibiotics in the pipeline. There's much more work to be done. But again, that was driven by facts and data and understanding what we might um, accomplish. The other thing I would say is the importance and leadership of bringing together the differences that divide us. And this is certainly true in the policy area. One of my proudest moments was when one of the magazines in Washington labeled us raging moderates. And I thought, well, if I can keep that label for the time that I'm in charge of Pew, that will be a success. Being able to bring together people from different political persuasions, different ideologies to work on a common goal. And I think that's true of a leader in any uh, career or discipline, but I'll give you one. And it involves, you might surprisingly find this surprising, uh, Rush Limbaugh, his recent passing. Um, we had come to understand that people who were serving in the military or living overseas were not able to vote for their commander in chief. Because of the way we got them ballots and what we required to get them back, they could not get their ballot back in time to be counted. I mean, this was a national disgrace and so unnecessary. So we launched a campaign actually with the Pentagon. Well, it needed to be have legislation passed. So we needed people on both sides of the aisle. And surprisingly, it was more of a struggle than I would have guessed until Rush Limbaugh heard about this and decided to make it a key part of his uh, program for like two weeks on end about calling this a national disgrace. Well, you know what? I didn't. I did never listened to Rush Limbaugh, but I became at least a short-term fan because he did more to allow us to be able to bridge the divides that we had in Congress uh, to get this uh, passed. I guess the other lesson I learned is that nothing really easy. Um, uh, excuse me. Nothing really important is ever easy. Um, and I think also that you know we need in life and particularly in leadership positions, we need to hope for the best, but we need to plan for the worst and always have um, an exit strategy. It was mentioned that I ran the 11 to seven shift in the um, ER. And you know, 
for sure, um, this is a place where you need to understand how to hope for the best and plan for the worst. And I really do believe those years of training helped me in every leadership position that I had uh, uh, to make or a leadership uh, decision. You know, a healthy dose of self-doubt and insecurity is really a good thing for a leader to have. First of all, uh, that humility helps us, I believe, make better decisions. It often motivates people around us uh, to offer their suggestions and to be uh, their best. A self-deprecating approach um, to leadership, I believe, is key. And admitting our mistakes much more loudly than we try to claim our successes. It's important to remember that success needs to have uh, many parents. Failure often only one, and that often falls at the foot of the leader. But we all need to learn from success, but learn even more uh, from our failures. You know, I, this is, seems to, so obvious to people in healthcare, but uh, in other groups, less so, that inaction is basically incapacitating. One of the big problems leaders often have is not their lack of willingness to make a decision without perfect information. And you never have perfect information. And all of us in healthcare know that hesitation is never um, our friend. In business, uh, it can cost profits, but in healthcare, it can actually cost a life. We have to take informed risk in, in every aspect of our business lives and our career uh, and also in our personal lives. And those risks need to be informed, but we cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good in terms of exercising our judgment and our experience. Um, hesitation, as I said, is highly problematic. You know, it's... Um, Thinking about that, uh, I was very unwilling to launch uh, one of our programs at Pew that became one of our most successful, and that was criminal justice reform. You probably know all of the data about how many people in America, one in a hundred um, uh, African American males are incarcerated in this country. Um, it, it, uh, we know that recidivism is high among people that are incarcerated even for nonviolent or, or petty crimes. So we set out to see if we couldn't help to reform the criminal justice system. The reason I was opposed is I was sure as heck we were gonna get labeled as the soft on crime crowd, that this was gonna hurt us in our work and that we would be seen as, shall we say, much too far uh, left of center. Well, I turned out to be really, really wrong. First of all, our first partner turned out to be the attorney general in Texas. And he became a huge advocate um, for criminal justice reform, not a state you would have picked for that, I'm sure. And then the Koch brothers became our partners in pushing for uh, this as a, a national movement. It now has gotten uh, lots of partners and lots of um, energy behind it. And I believe that the public, both in terms of the dollars that they spend on criminal justice reform, but even more importantly, the lives that are saved and turned into productive citizens has been uh, the result. You know, um, I wanna talk about another mentoring moment um, that uh, happened in Charlottesville. And um, I was really fortunate to be asked at a fairly young age to serve on the board at Monticello the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. And um, I had many, many mentors uh, on that board. It was my first. Uh, Lee Cochran was the chair known to, I'm sure many in this audience, a phenomenal individual and a great role model for female leadership. Uh, uh, and Dan Jordan, who I'm sure many of you know, was our very effective um, president. Well, um, probably a year or two into my ten tenure on the board, um, the whole issue of Sally Hemings uh, emerged uh, as a, a very important topic. Well, this was highly debated and contested around the country, but also in the boardroom. And uh, to be honest, we had a couple of board members that felt 
that we should just not involve ourselves with this that it could disparage Mr. Jefferson's reputation. Our job was to support his reputation and his legacy. And these were very important donors um, to the institution. And I'll never forget the moment when Dan Jordan stood up with strong support from his chair, Lee Cochran, and, they, and, they, and he said, we will do what Mr. Jefferson had always taught. We will follow truth wherever it may take us. And so again, at great personal sacrifice and also what could have been somewhat hurtful um, to the financial well-being of Monticello, the leaders did the right thing. And again, every time I've been confronted with a decision, I always think um, I never wanna be put in a situation where I would have say, say to myself afterwards, I should have, could have, would have, if I'd only done the right thing. So I guess my, my most important message for all of you in your leadership roles, and I know you all have many, um, is to always be proud of the decision you make and know that you follow truth wherever it may take you. You know, Charlottesville, it was, was said, has been a very important part of my life. Um, I was born and raised there. and. I must say, um, some of the recent events watching them on the national news were very troubling and sad. You know, I spent every Sunday playing in Lee Park, partly to make sure I wouldn't have to go to Sunday school too long at the church right across the street. Um, my father was the head of the parks. And so seeing these situations just was very troubling to me and sad that we really hadn't in Charlottesville moved on very far from when I was um, getting ready to go to the first grade. I remember coming home uh, all excited, it was first my first year in school and my mother setting me down and she said, you know, you can't go back to school. And I couldn't understand this. And uh, the question was why? And she said, well, they've closed all the public schools in Charlottesville. And people find this story sort of amazing when they think about the Charlottesville of today, but they did. They closed them all rather than integrate them. And your parents had one of three choices. They would be wealthy enough to send you to a private school. That wasn't us. They would um, basically send you off to live with relatives in another town to attend school. And that wasn't gonna happen for us. Or they paid the teachers uh, to teach in church basements with groceries. And maybe that's why I'm not really good with math. I'd still do the tip on my fingers under the dinner table, but I did get a, a decent education until they reopened uh, the public schools, but it took many years. And it's um, so I guess in hearing about some of the recent problems, I had hoped that maybe um, Charlottesville had advanced beyond that, but I'm delighted to hear that now the conversations are much more uh, transparent and inclusive and healthy. When I got ready to go to uh, university, um, it was just about the time that the university was still fighting about whether to admit women. And now I understand that women have taken their place uh, in leadership and throughout um, um, Mr. Jefferson's university as they should have many decades before they were allowed to. And then when I entered nursing, there was a battle royal about advanced practice nurses. Were we even going to have them? Were physicians going to let them practice? Um, if they let them practice, under how tight of a thumb? How many times did they need to get their prescriptions um, signed off on? I bet Pam would tell me we've come a long way, but maybe not all the way that some of us would hope. Uh, nurse practitioners, other advanced practice nurses are, are vital to the healthcare system. Those of us that have either been part of the healthcare system as a patient or watched from afar, absolutely and know this. But you know, standing up for what you think is right and gonna be helpful is not easy. Um, Dick Adlick, who many of you knew, was somebody who would always speak truth to power. Sometimes I think the powers that be weren't always happy to hear from him. Um, but he was the one that really led the charge to start the emergency nurse practitioner program of which I was in the first class, which now is part of the acute care um, nurse practitioner uh, program. 
And he is the one that really deserves the credit uh, for Pegasus. He fought hard for that because people in the Western part of the state really had access to no um, emergency care and people were dying or severely injured and unnecessarily so because we couldn't get them to the great care provided um, in Charlottesville. So for all those people that blazed the trail and taught me so much about leadership, I am eternally grateful, but I wanna come back and express my gratitude to the University of Virginia, to the School of Nursing, not, not for the great education I got, but for the life experiences it taught me that I hope I, I in turn uh, was able to share with some of my staff along the way and certainly informed a lot of the programs um, at Pew that were um, helpful uh, to others. It was great training. Uh, I did have uh, a bit of luck along the way. I don't want to uh, deny that. But above all else, I had wonderful partners, people I could count on, people I trusted, and people who were much more talented in many ways that made our successes uh, possible. And people often say they want to make a difference in their career. And I say, well, you know, making a difference can come in many ways. But the most important thing is to have great joy in what you do. Know that you're doing the right thing. Know that you're giving back and have as few regrets as possible. And I certainly uh, can say that. So I have the deepest admiration and respect for all of the healthcare providers, um, as I said, when I started. And I wanna thank them, but I also wanna thank their friends and family because they have sacrificed so much along the way and particularly during uh, this uh, pandemic. And to thank them all for selflessly putting themselves in harm's way each and every day for the well being of all of us. Thank you very much, and hopefully, we can have some questions. Thank you, Rebecca, so much. And I will ask um, Pam Cipriano if you would like to sit in on the QA conversation. We will welcome uh, your voice in this. Um, in this conversation as well. That was a wonderful talk and you took us um, many places and always as, as promised, you, you anchored us uh, definitely in nursing. And so um, for those of us who've, who've worked with nurses um, for years and years, it, it was lovely to see all of those um, talents and skills um, celebrated and, and their, their practical use in so many domains uh, celebrated. So, so thank you so much. Um, for starters, uh, one of the things you said right at the beginning was once a nurse, always a nurse, as you reminded that Wall Street Journal reporter. Um, so to extend uh, nursing even as a metaphor, we have a question um, at Pew across all those years of service. Um, whom did you consider your most challenging patients? Was it staff, donors, board members, grant recipients, the public? Um, wow. <laughs> I, I, to be honest, I would probably say the press. Um, it's uh, they they do their job and I admire what they do, but it's often very difficult to tell two sides uh, of a story. Um, and um, I think, uh, it, particularly if you're working on a challenging issue, uh, that was some of the hardest dynamics to to manage. Certainly, again, going back to the comments about the Barnes Foundation and the effort to try and save the collection and relocate it. Much was written and said because it made for great copy, but it was not true. And it, uh, and in some cases was quite hurtful to some of the donor partners. And, you know, my board stood beside me and um, uh, they had every reason to doubt that decision from time to time. You know, I think anyone that's been in management and leadership knows that um, one of the great thrills is managing and mentoring staff, but it's also one of the things that, um, some days can be uh, a great challenge, but trust is key. And having a trusting relationship with your staff and with your board, if there isn't trust and a mutual respect and understanding, then it makes everything impossible. So 
uh, working in that trust only comes with um, time and experience, candor, um, and I think this openness to admitting uh, mistakes and including people uh, in your in your decisions. So, you know, I know some of the conventional wisdom uh, is that you shouldn't stay in any job more than five years. Of course, I'm the <laughs> I would be an utter failure by those criteria, but I think. Um, some longevity is helpful, particularly in leadership positions, because um, it does allow time to build trust and mutual respect. And um, you need to rely on that, particularly during difficult times. It does strike me, though, that in thinking about establishing trust, uh, thinking of your experience as a nurse in nursing, particularly perhaps most, um, most often in emergency department situations, um, establishing trust with a patient at his or her most vulnerable or with a family is something that needs to happen quickly and efficiently and effectively. Any thoughts on how having, having learned to do that early on translated into your work with Pew? Well, I should have commented one of the other characteristics that's absolutely vital is empathy. And I think sitting with someone and being a good listener and letting them know perhaps that you have um, in some ways shared in a similar experience, walked in their shoes, or at least if not, have some understanding of uh, the challenges and difficulty they may uh, be facing. One of my most difficult, difficult moments in my nursing school training uh, was that we were assigned patients. And I was assigned a young woman, um, who had anorexia nervosa. And I worked and worked and worked with her and I could not understand why she was not getting better. And ultimately, sadly, we lost her. And uh, I think that probably taught me more about the importance of listening and empathy. I don't think that I probably did as good a job as maybe I could have. I've often wondered if I'd been better um, at it, it would have made any difference. So I think this, a uh, sense that um, to walk in another's shoes, or at least to um, imagine what they might must be experiencing has to be key. And people understand that in their interactions, we all do. And we know if it's real and we know if it's not. And building that quick trust, which is your point, I think uh, it, it requires those types of skills. I may put Pam on the spot a little and just say, so are we teaching that now? If so, how? I am so impressed with the nurses who uh, we are graduating today. Um, absolutely. Uh, part, of, part of what we teach is to, and this may sound an exaggeration, but you have to almost be fearless. I mean, you have to be able to pursue what you think is right. You have to be able to uh, comfortably ask questions. As Rebecca said, you know, you have to kind of question yourself and your competency in that moment. You have to be open to feedback. And our clinical faculty, I believe, are really excellent as they support students in the moment, in, in those clinical settings. Uh, they can tell if someone is a little uncomfortable and take them aside and have that conversation. So, uh, you know, we, again, are enormously proud of, of our students, our, our faculty, that are our permanent faculty, as well as our clinical partners who actually are there in the moment for, for the patient interactions. Because, because nursing is, is not for the faint of heart. I mean, it is, it is not, the, as you know, it is not the, just the skills. It is, it is that insight. It is that intuition. It is um, understanding the reliance on your team members. It is uh, uh, being able to pull together all of the things that you know and have learned and be able to then formulate a plan sometimes very quickly to have that those communication skills with the individual or with the family because you know going back to your question about trust absolutely there is almost a a need to instantaneously convey uh, that you you are in command of your knowledge and that's sometimes challenging for a student because they see themselves in the learner role and haven't haven't had as many opportunities yet to be able to build that self-confidence. But I am uh, very pleased with, with the uh, skill and knowledge that our, that our students uh, emerge from our program with. Great. 
So we have a, a combination comment and question from a gentleman named Jeff Allen. As the luckiest husband of a UVA nurse, I have been active with the UVA School of Nursing for almost 50 years. What's the magic in the water there? That's not the question for you. Um, but he says he thinks it's the high social IQ, which is cultivated through each nursing school class and their interactions with such a driven and caring faculty, as Pam was, was just saying. Once that caring and understanding approach to mankind is established, I think UVA nurses can go anywhere and easily lead others. What do you think? Oh, I have no doubt. <laughs> I wish I'd said it. I wish I'd make, I could have take that and maybe make that uh, my talk. No, I couldn't uh, agree more. Uh, you know, it is, you said it well, it is the social IQ. It's the self-awareness. It's the humility uh, that comes with the training and also the mentoring. I know I commented on this, but, you know, not everybody arrives at nursing school sort of wired exactly um, ready for the profession. And I do believe learning the technical side of it, while it's vitally uh, important, it's probably more easily teach and uh, easily more easily learned than the empathy, um, the, the social IQ that one needs. You know, I always laughingly say it took me about three years to understand that how every July 1st, I became like super smart. And then I got gradually, I lost that over the year as the interns and residents um, matriculated through their training. Um, but you know, how do you, how do you insert yourself? How do you motivate others? How do you, um, these are skills that a leader needs and these are skills that a nurse needs to learn very early in her career. So lucky you uh, for having married uh, a UVA nurse. Uh, I'm sure it has enriched your life enormously. So one of the other things uh, you talked about uh, was this, um, was practicing uh, using informed risk um, as, as something that you learned to practice in healthcare. But in that same vein, it struck me and the examples you gave from your experience at Pew, that Pew um, as an organization has not in recent years shied away from some of the hard questions and big issues. Um, facing us, um, including as you were as you were saying, some some political um, issues. Um, but you seem to have come to know and rely on your moral compass uh, in the in the kind of leadership uh, work you were doing at Pew. And I wonder if you'd say something about you know where does this um, what what's the anchorage for your moral compass in nursing? Well. I think it really does go back to watching individuals who you deeply admire and then asking yourself, why do you admire them so much? And, um, and then conversely, looking at people who are leading and you maybe have a little less respect and what is it uh, that um, you do not want to emulate? And I think that more than anything for me, obviously I give credit to early upbringing, some of these events like uh, discrimination to me, I, I, I find it just so difficult to onboard probably in large part because watching it, how it affected so many, including myself at a very young age. Um, so I do think we are a, very much a product of our experiences. Um, and I try once a month to ask myself, um, what did I learn that really surprised me this month? I used to try to do it once a week, <laughs> but now, what, uh, who did I learn it from? Who, who did something that I really thought was exceptional or I admired? And who did I think really blew it <laughs> in, in some way? And, it, and I try to do these with personal experiences, not people that I see on the news. Or I mean, I think that's in some ways a little bit too easy to judge situations uh, that you're not part of. And, and that's been really, really helpful in sort of recalibrating one's compass because uh, it, times change, circumstances change, and we don't always get it right. 
And I think if we think that we, you know, deserve or we occupy the higher ground, um, that's a very dangerous place to put ourselves as a leader. Mm -hmm. You alluded to um, sort of learning from a variety of people, encountering a, a variety of, of people and personalities um, in, the, in the course of your work. And one of the people you mentioned from your early years at UVA is someone I also knew, Dick Edlick, um, plastic surgeon, but so much more. Um, and his, uh, his work with uh, establishing Pegasus, um, in later years, when you had moved on to Pew, I was working in uh, an administrative office where Dick Edlake would make visits maybe once a month, maybe once every two months in his little motorized scooter. His new mission, and he was just as fierce an advocate for this, was to scout throughout the health system facilities for any places that were not fully accessible to disabled persons. And he found plenty. And he every time was just as um, fierce and energized an advocate for um, that kind of accessibility uh, in that I, way. I only laugh because he could be dogged and you don't yes. want to get, you didn't want to get in those crosshairs. <laughs> I think they would have launched Pegasus uh, just to make Dick stop complaining about it, but no, he, th that's what leadership sometimes takes. It's somebody with a very, very clear purpose, but you have to be able to motivate others. And he was able to motivate obviously many others on a handicap accessibility and certainly to motivate me to be out there championing and many, many others on air ambulance service back in a time where that seems so obvious now, but you know, in the late seventies, that was not so obvious. You know, and he he also was, you know, just a memorable personality in so many ways. And and it strikes me that as in nursing and again in the emergency room, you can open the door or pull back the curtain and you know, what memorable person are you going to meet there and you you deal with you deal with well and and you know I not to make this too personal story, but I just had so many people at UVA that gave me uh, a helping hand. I mean, had Don Jane not hired me as a nurse practitioner, uh, had um, the team not supported me in my head injury research, uh, you know, had not, and the list goes on. So, so many people, um, you know, offering a helping hand, giving some, you know, very wise advice. So I, I really, to watch the institution and how it's flourished, and particularly the School of Nursing, it's 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 been a treat. Mm -hmm. So you retired in 2020, our COVID year. Um, we have a question um, that's asking uh, about this new territory of requirement. What fills your days post Pew? Well, let me be the first to tell people it's not nearly as scary as advertised, and I do believe it is highly underrated. Uh, everyone told me before I retired that, oh my gosh, you know, um, your workaholic tendencies, you'll have to go through some form of detoxification. I think my husband was a little bit anxious, more than a little bit. Um, you know, I, I have found it delightful to be able to, um, to pursue many things that I'd ever had time for, reading and a uh, hundred other, other things. I still continue to serve on um, boards of, of, of healthcare companies and other kinds of boards. And I do occasionally get to talk to my successor as she's managing very ably um, the future agenda uh, for view. Actually, the timing, again, was luck and a gift because you might, find that I'm very much of a hands-on people person manager. Uh, some people say I like to control things a fair amount. Probably that's not always a compliment. I think managing during COVID has been extremely, would have been extremely difficult for me and probably has been for a lot of people, both uh, leaders um, and um, their colleagues and, and employees. So uh, probably uh, the timing could not have been better, but uh, I also hope it's going to give me time to revisit my roots in Charlottesville, where I still have family and the School of Nursing. Uh, some of those things had to be put on hold, obviously. 
Yeah, we're so sorry that you couldn't be here with us in person today. One, um, one thing that you mentioned, and, and I'll direct this question uh, first to Rebecca and also to Pam, um, you were talking about the importance of finding joy in your work. And, and in some ways that's, a, that's an important anchorage uh, as well. So I found myself hoping that our health professionals working today um, aren't too busy to be joyful um, and maybe to have the time and the energy um, to uh, engage, to locate and engage uh, their joy. Do you have any... Um, good counsel for people who feel that they're overworked and overstressed. Um, they do have sources of joy, but how do they tap into that? Well, I would hope uh, that healthcare systems uh, would um, reflect once COVID is in the rear view mirror about how to re-energize um, and to reward uh, our healthcare providers, whether that is, and this is, <laughs> I'm sure if they're healthcare providers in the, uh, or administrators in the audience, they may go up, oh, you're out on a limb, but to give people perhaps uh, a week of sort of uh, self renewal and rejuvenation uh, or a chance to perhaps uh, spend time uh, with family over above their normal vacation or, or leave time because they gave and continue to give 150%. And I think if we could just give something back to allow them the, to recalibrate, um, because uh, again, it's really hard to seek joy if you're feeling completely exhausted, overworked, and I would hope none of them do, but maybe under undervalued. So that said, I think there is probably a few professions that tell you every day if you made a difference. I hear so many people say, I want a career where I'm making a difference. I say, well, you gotta look at nursing because every day when you leave your shift, you know if you made a difference and you will virtually always know it's a yes. And then coupling that with the joy that comes from lifetime of learning, giving back, caring. I mean, it's a great, great formula. And my guess is a lot of people are gonna understand that and I bet you, applications to nursing schools are going to soar. People are going to really want to pursue uh, this profession because they're going to understand that they are going to be able to make a difference and have a joyful career at it. Pam, yeah, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Marcia. And, and I think Rebecca is, is right on target with, with many of the things that she pointed out. I think it's also helpful for us to recognize that prior to the pandemic, the whole concept of joy at work was really being challenged. As healthcare has become more complex, more and more uh, work has been added to the, to the delivery of care, such as documentation, such as uh, many different kinds of reporting that are important, like quality outcomes and things like that. But it has often been additive as opposed to how, how do we figure out how to uh, have some kind of balance and the amount of time and the effort that's required to have that very personalized care being delivered. And so for nurses, physicians, pharmacists, others who have been in that really challenging spot of having to do more where, where uh, the most meaningful work is that interaction with patients, We've, we had seen joy begin to be eroded. And so it's really been a dual responsibility of organizations as well as all of our healthcare professionals to say, how do we restore joy? How do we make sure that we remove the, the work that's not necessary, that we use technology to help with efficiency and to replace some of the onerous requirements of regulation and those kinds of things. So it was just magnified with the pandemic. Unfortunately, we have been hearing uh, for almost a year now, how overworked and, and exhausted our caregivers are. And many of them, unfortunately, do not feel valued by their organizations for a whole variety of reasons. And for uh, members of society that haven't really followed the protective mechanisms that have also put healthcare uh, practitioners at risk. So, so it's an important time for us to regroup, not just in the healthcare industry and not just in our, in our organizations, but to engage the public around how important it is for us to restore joy for, our, for all of the people that work in healthcare across the board, 
as well as recognize that um, organizations have a responsibility. We're fortunate at the University of Virginia, our wisdom and well-being programs are really focused on saying we, we are united in recognizing that it's important to take care of our caregivers. Great, thank you. Well, we've come to the end of an hour, but I have to say what a joy it's been to have <laughs> Rebecca Rimel here with us and Pam Cipriano also. Um, what a joy also to hear about the creation, thanks to the Pew Charitable Trusts, of the Rebecca W. Rimel Dean of Nursing Endowed Professorship at UVA in recognition of Rebecca and her leadership. Um, I'll encourage you to come back uh, next week. We have a program featuring um, architect Sarah Jensen Carr from Northeastern University and environmental planner, Timothy Beatley from UVA School of Architecture, a program on the topography of wellness, how health and disease have shaped the American landscape with some anticipation of how COVID is going to change design around our cities and our places of life and work. Uh, so please join us then. Again, thank you, Rebecca Rimel, Pam Cipriano, and all of you, thank you for your attention. Thank you.